Okay, perfect. Chris, thanks for sitting down with us today to talk through all of the concerns that we've been getting from many of your customers. Let's kind of get right to it with that rate increase that just came this month. A 6% increase on people's bills for their power. You say it's to pay for technology to help improve service, but when will customers actually see the benefits from this? Well, they're actually seeing the benefits today and have been for the last couple of years. So uh, the technology that most of that technology is around smart circuitry. Um, so it's trying to bring the distribution system into the 21st century, basically. And so what that really means is, is the system is self-healing. So if the system detects an outage, let's say we have an outage right now, and it affects a thousand customers, then the way the system's being set up now is, is those thousand customers, the system itself without any human intervention, will then look at those thousand customers and decide that this outage really only needs to be about 300 customers. So it'll shrink the outage to 300 and it'll automatically restore the other folks immediately within milliseconds. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the technology that we're putting on the system to do that. And this is all investment. Do you know the dollar figure of how much money you're gonna invest into the system? Uh, not total, I think Phil can certainly get you that. I don't have that memorized, but it's a multi-year installation. And then the second piece behind that installation is what's called an AMI meter. It's, it's an automated meter. So if every business or every home has a meter on their house or on their business, it kind of measures the usage, and that's so we can bill you. And what's on there today is an old, it's, uh, it's not the old electromechanical that used to have the spinning wheel. It is a digital meter today, but it's, a, it's technically not what I call a smart meter. It, it communicates one way only, and it communicates out to a reader or someone driving by your house or your business, and it'll take a reading off that meter to develop a bill. The new meters that we're putting now, the AMI meters, they're an interface meter that communicates two ways, and it allows us, the company, to look at the usage on the house. It allows us to say, is the power out? So technically, I can know now, if I have one of those AMI meters, I may know for your power's out before you do. You may be at work, at the store, or whatever. We may know, and then this automated system will have those meters talking to it, and it'll be able to shrink that outage. That's the key to this whole system. This increase is one of nine over the past decade for Appalachian Power Companies. And right now people are paying about $50 more on average than they did back in 2011. Most of those customers, they're on fixed incomes. They're calling us saying they're frustrated about this. I'm sure they're calling you as well. What do you want to say to them? Well, and they are calling us, right? And look, we understand that and we totally do understand it. But we also receive a lot of calls too about my reliability or my outage takes too long or you didn't respond fast enough. And so what I would say to them is this, right? Our, our prices are below the U.S. average. That's a known fact. EIA data will tell you that. But what I'll tell them is, is this, right? this system that we have is expensive to maintain. So the beauty about living in West Virginia is the beauty of West Virginia, right? And the hills and the mountains and the trees. The downfall for a power company is the hills, the mountains, and the trees. And so it makes it very expensive to maintain the system. And so what I would tell them is, is look, we, we understand the impact that these increases are having. We, uh, we try to do everything we can in our power to minimize those impacts. And we do do that by keeping our operation and maintenance costs low or hopefully flat, which kind of minimizes that impact to the customer. Then the other thing we try to do as a company, we look out to the market to buy energy. So can I buy it cheaper than I can make it? Sometimes maybe yes, sometimes maybe no. If I can, I will buy that energy instead of making it. So it's a make-buy decision. And if I can do that, then that cost is passed on to the customer. So we try to do everything in our power to minimize the impacts, but look, things cost more. In the last year alone, we've seen anywhere from 15 to 50% increase in cost for things, pieces, parts. Labor is up, I think everyone's well aware. So all those things come to us, those get passed off to the customer as we try to keep getting the work done to try and make the system more resilient. You mentioned reliability. The, according to the latest federal report, West Virginia ranked number one in the country for power outages. And those are power outages that aren't caused by storms. And it means that it's really that your equipment is what's failing and leaving people in the dark because of that. And one of the things that stuck out to me when we look at um, the graph from the federal data is West Virginia has twice as many of those non-event outages as a state like Maine that's in second place. So as president of the company, are you kind of embarrassed by these numbers? Well, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm embarrassed because I think you said it's our equipment that's failing. And what we will tell you and have the data to prove to you, it's actually trees falling through our equipment, not our equipment failing. And it's trees outside of the right of way. And so not how familiar you are with this, but so when you look at a line running somewhere and you'll look at, you'll see trees are cut on the left and right hand side of that line. 
the width of that cut is based on the voltage that's on that line. The higher the voltage, the wider the width. And that is all done through, with the landowner, we get permission to cut those trees to that width. I can't cut it any wider than that, even if I want to. Now, I can go to the landowner and probably either pay more or get their permission to cut wider, but the costs go up to do that. So what we have found is since we started our veg management program uh, that the state asked us to start in 04, or in, I'm sorry, in 14, uh, we went through and now have, we've clear cut all of our circuits end to end. It's taken a little over five years to do that. And what we have found that all other utilities have found since they've done this outside of West Virginia is you run into what's called an edge, uh, a, uh, trees on the edge of your right of way issue. And what that really means is, is these trees are now exposed to either wind, rain, or both. So those trees, we're seeing a high level of those trees fall. And they're, sometimes they're a totally healthy tree, sometimes they're an ash tree that's been killed by the ash borer. And so when those trees fall, they go through our equipment. Number one cause of all of our outages is tree related. That is number one, but last year you had 6,000 outages caused by tree. There were 4,100 outages caused by your equipment failure. So mm -hmm. do you clearly have a problem with your equipment? I, I don't agree with that. So we, there is a graph and, and you probably have it. It's in, our, it's in our report we gave to the Public Service Commission. It lays out every single item that causes an outage by cause. Um, it's all public information and you can look through it and it very clearly is not an, it's not a, an equipment issue from a failure of equipment. It, it is a whole host of things, trees out of the right of way, number one. Trees uh, inside the right of way, that used to be a high number for us, it's a very low number now based on our veg management program. But uh, I would not say that equipment failure is the number one cause. It was the number two cause last year. Okay. And does that not concern you? How are you gonna make those numbers go down? Well, it does concern us. All outages concern us. So whether it's a tree out of the right of way, equipment failure, a, an animal on the line, bus failure, whatever, they all concern us. And our, we have a five-year reliability plan that we've built that addresses all of these circuits. If you're familiar with the filing with the Public Service Commission, we have what's called, uh, you kind of keep track of your worst performing circuits is the terminology that's used. We track those circuits, we know where they are, we know how long they've been on that worst performing list, and we build a plan to fix those. And the thing you have to remember though about West Virginia is, is once again, beautiful state, love living here. The problem is, is it's a beautiful state with a lot of hills and a lot of trees. So we maintain roughly about uh, 23,000 line miles. Okay, and they're not like these lines running in this backyard behind us. These lines run up through haulers and up over the hills and through the woods. And so maintaining 23,000 line miles is hard to do. It's expensive to do. 500 circuits. So think about that. And it takes years to upgrade your system. So this system is an old system. I think you probably well know that. This system, early 1900s, 1910, 1920. Some of that stuff's still in service today. And it's serving a lot of the stuff in the southern part of the state. We're upgrading that from a transmission perspective. For upgrading it from a distribution perspective. But if you said today, go fix it all today, you can't fix it all today. There's not enough money, there's not enough people to do it. So those older equipment, it is what's failing, you're saying? Nope. It's all kinds of equipment fail. We, we bought brand new pieces of equipment and installed and they failed right out of the box. A piece of equipment been in service for 100 years doesn't fail. There's no, there is no gotcha here that says that's the piece of equipment you gotta go fix. Every circuit's different, every problem's different. Do you guys reimburse people for hotels or groceries after a power outage? We do not. Why do you not do that? We're not required to do that by the law. Even when it's a customer who has an outage caused by an equipment failure? That's correct. So when is an outage your fault where you would have to do that? I don't think there ever is an issue where we have to do that based on how the law's set up. So an outage is never your fault? So I don't know about what you're about, talking about fault. You're asked if we would pay for groceries. We don't do that, but that's not a requirement of us as part of our service contract. But you have people out there, I'm not sure how well you know your customers, or people that on a Monday might go spend their entire grocery budget to fill their fridge. And on Wednesday, they might lose that entire refrigerator due to a power outage. These are people who spent their entire budget. They don't mm -hmm. have more money to go out and buy more groceries or to pay for a hotel room due to an outage. Right, I totally understand, and we do understand our customer base very well. Um, but the reality though is, is there's, there's no way that we can one, predict when an outage is gonna happen, at least not yet. We don't have the technology yet to do that. 
But the second part is, is there's no way we can be accountable for that. We just don't know when that's going to happen. I don't know when that person is going to make that investment. Just, I don't know that. So you don't know when an outage is going to happen, even if it's your equipment that's failing that causes it? Unless we schedule it, no. Okay. We're sitting just a couple blocks from an area in Milton that was without power for 10 days back during last winter's ice storm and that mm -hmm. bitter cold temperatures. There's Correct. other areas that were without power for up to a month mm -hmm. due to the ice storm. You have an issue with your equipment. How do you fix something like that? Well, first of all, the ice storm was two ice storms back to back within less than a week. That was a historic storm for our system. And I will tell you, I think we fixed that. So we recovered from that storm faster than most people thought we ever could. We brought in over 2,000 resources from off system that supported our internal resources. Um, but there was tremendous amount of damage from that storm. No equipment, I don't care what equipment you had installed, would survive that storm. That same storm first hit Texas, though. And in Texas, they're not used to dealing with ice storms. Mm -hmm. They're not used to those sorts of recovery efforts. They got the power back on in Texas faster than you guys did here in West Virginia. To, to, you're, you're comparing apples and oranges. It's two totally different things. They, have you been to Texas? Yes. Where were you at in Texas? Yes, Texas is much flatter, but in all due respect, the mountains and the power lines have been, the mountains and trees have been here longer than the power lines have been. In some cases, the trees. So let me ask you this. Take that pole right there, right behind us. How would you and like four other guys like to grab hold of that and carry it up a mountainside, dig the hole and set it by hand? Because that's what we were doing. It's a lot of work for you guys, but there are people out there who are having to go out and scrape together money to buy a generator to try to stay warm during these power outages. Yep, understand. Did you lose power during the storm? I did. How long were you out? A for? week. Do you have a generator at your house? I do. Why? Because I, when I bought the house, it was there. I moved here from Ohio. Do you like? that you have a generator? Yes. Did you say you lose power often and it helps you because of the power outages? It makes it more convenient. But these are people that are going out there and they expect their power to work and to be on. Mm -hmm. Why should they have to go spend the money on that when they should just be paying their utilities for it to work? I, and I agree, but like I said once again, very old system. We are upgrading it as fast as we can. We have to remember, you have to balance a couple of things here, right? So if we go fix everything today, the price goes up more. Why? Because you had to pay for material and labor to do it, correct? And so what we're saying is, is you've got to balance how fast you modernize, upgrade, resiliency, whatever you want to call it. You gotta to have to balance that with the amount of impact you're gonna have on the customer. And so remember, we have to fix transmission system, a distribution system, and we still create generation for the employee. So all of those systems have to be maintained and upgraded to basically bring them up to snuff. And you're passing those costs on to the customer. That is correct, that's how it works. But AEP, your parent company, made $14 billion last year. Mm -hmm. Why not just cut some of that profit and revenue to invest in these systems? Well, so that's a totally different question. So that question is all about investment, right? So. And that's different. So let me ask you this. If you do personal investments, would you invest in something that gave you 4% back? Or would you invest your money in something that gave you 10% back? Where you, would you spend your you money? You guys are a monopoly. You, there is no other option for people when it comes to power. I understand that. But there is an option for folks that pay for all this stuff. And those are called our investors. So realize when we do an upgrade, so we buy that truck behind you. That truck's paid for by investment from our investors. I then get to recover that cost from our rate payers. And that may take five years, 10 years, or 30 years, depending on what it is we bought. So do you care more about your investors I than do you not, your customers? I, I never said that. I said that you have to give an investor a good, a good platform to invest in or they won't invest in you. And you have to balance that with everything else you're doing. With the ice storm, you guys even sent out a press release saying that you were preparing for it. You brought in hundreds of people yep. due to that, yet there were still people that were without power for a long time. Correct. How in the world does that happen in 2021? It's not the 1800s. I agree, it's not the 1800s. And I, I thought I explained that earlier, but how that happens is because of where we are and, and where we live and the terrain we live in. So there was a circuit in Wayne County, it's the one you're referencing where folks were out the longest. I don't know if you're familiar with mm -hmm. where that is. But that, that circuit, 60 some poles had to be replaced for five customers, five, mm -hmm. 60 poles. See how long that takes? 
So the way you work this is, is you restore the circuits that are either hospitals, what I'll call critical infrastructure. Hospitals first, schools, businesses, and you do the biggest bang for the buck first. So what's the fastest way I can get the most customers on? And that's who you do first. And then as you work your way down the list of priority, you get back to these, I'll call maybe like five, 10, one, six customers, whatever. They're the ones that take the longest. They're all the ones that also have the most damage because they're on a very long lateral which means it's basically they're on a very long extension cord off a main circuit. And that's why it takes that long. So you're going back to the trees and those sorts of things that are causing that's the correct. outages. And down in that same circuit, we've talked a lot about the tree trimming that's done to try to reduce that. Right. And in the 4K area, I talked to the woman who's without power for 16 days due mm -hmm. to the ice storm down in that area. And you're kind of blaming the vegetation management and the need for the trees to be trimmed for this whole issue. But this is a photo of outside of her house right now. Mm -hmm. Yep. Are you doing your job? Sure we are. So this is not ours. This would be an electric line here, but yeah, clearly it's overgrown. There's no doubt about it. One pole. And so I have no idea when we trimmed this circuit, but it's been trimmed in the last four years. I know that for a fact. The way this, the vegetation management process is set up, you have to have them all trimmed end to end within a four-year cycle. Now we're starting round two. So I have no idea where the circuit lies and all that. We can certainly get you that if you're interested. But this circuit has been trimmed, and I can tell it's been trimmed when I look down through here and see that there's no trees around. This is kudzu growing up, the, growing up the, the pole. Is that normal? It is very normal, yes. So it's something we kind of see across the state? Yes. But could that cause a power outage or cause a transformer to blow? Uh, I, I guess you could assume, I don't know, probably. To me, that looks more like a tree than it does a power pole. Well, if you're in the power industry, it looks like cuts you growing up a power pole. That's what it looks like. But do you understand that people who live right there say they're paying for you to clean these lines, okay. and to them it doesn't look like you're doing it? Okay, once again, we have thousands of miles of line. I have four years to trim them from end to end. This kudzu probably grew like this in less than a year, would be my guess, because of how fast it grows. There are ways to treat that with herbicides and other things like that, but since this is in someone's front yard, we don't treat with herbicide because it's in a front yard. And so there are all kinds of issues, and just picking one pole out of the entire circuitry that we maintain, it's not a good representation. So if you say this is a common issue across the area, and that can grow in a year, it's, you can't maintain it. So why not? I didn't say we can't maintain it. Those are your, your words. You said that you are unable to go in and trim these every year. You do it on a four year cycle. Mm -hmm. And if that can grow in one year, why not put the power lines underground where they can't be impacted by stuff like that? We certainly can do that. And I don't, then no one can afford that. To put the, these are high voltage lines, the lines on top that you see here. To bury those under the ground, which you can certainly do. It is hugely expensive to do that. You say hugely expensive, but West Virginia Power Companies have spent over a billion dollars over the past decade on these sorts of maintenance issues. Mm -hmm. You couldn't touch it for a billion. You couldn't touch it for 20 or 30 billion, putting it all underground. So at this, what is the solution to it? Well, there's, there's lots of solutions, right? And the problem is, is there is no one solution. That's the issue. And I think everyone wants to have that. What's that golden? What's that golden bullet, right, that I take and, and it fixes it? And the problem is there just isn't one. So one, you have to have your veg management program, which we do and we're following and we're seeing great results from it. It created this trees outside of the right of way issue that we're dealing with. We're trying to widen the right of way on the uphill side to try and address trees falling through our equipment. So that's one way. That's, and then for areas like this, as you get farther down into it, technology is helpful. We talked about putting the smart circuitry on. So for instance, this customer's fed off of this pole, it looks like to me, I would say that uh, you can put smart circuitry on here and if this line would go out from coming back towards us, we could refeed this customer from here automatically, they would never know it even happened. Okay, that's technology. How the, long until the entire state's covered in that The technology? entire state won't be covered in that because the cost is just too prohibitive. So then maybe for this one, maybe to solve this problem down in Wayne is maybe you have a smaller source generating electricity right there. That's another way, so you get rid of these long lines to get it there. All of those things become the solution. There is no one solution. So 
if you can't cover the entire state in these smart circuits that you're now charging a 6% surcharge for, when will people see that improvement? They're seeing it right now. So already they, we've saw over 4 million minutes that have not happened to customers because of the smart circuitry, and that's about 40 circuits are installed right now. 4 million minutes. So it doesn't sound like a lot, I realize. But that's 4 million minutes. Somebody's electric wasn't off for 4 million minutes. That, that's a lot. But across the state, we're doing this vegetation management program. Mm -hmm. And since 2012, there was the derecho. We had mm -hmm. a very long outage. Yes. We still don't seem to have appeared to fix that issue with the vegetation management issue because your dur outage duration caused by trees has gone up even during this time period. Understand. And, and that's what I was talking to you about. So there's two types of tr outages by trees. You have what's called trees in the right of way. That's that area where you're allowed to trim by, by your right of way. And then there's trees outside of your right of way. And that's the trees that are on the outside. So these are outages caused by trees. So what you're looking at here, these are the trees out of right of way. So trim cycle started, you see in a little dip, you see these outside of the right-of-way trees impacted, you see a huge rise. That's what we're seeing. And we're not the only utility that's seeing that. You're gonna have a 40-foot tree right outside of your 40-foot right-of-way. It'll come right over and take out a power line. That's correct. Do you need to widen those right-of-ways? How do you actually improve those so people aren't in the dark more often and for mm -hmm. longer as the numbers show they are? Well, so we're, in some cases, we are widening that right-of-way especially if it's, a, if it's a line on a hillside, right? So we're only trying to widen the uphill side. Because every time you want to widen that, it costs more money. And ideally, the homeowner will let you do it. If the homeowner will not let you do it, then you cannot widen your right away. And so you're stuck with the issue we have right here. Now, we do have a thing called a danger tree program that we are allowed to do through the Public Service Commission. So let's say we clear this right away out and we're all done and we look right to the edge of the right away and there sits an ash tree that's dead from the ash borer, which we have everywhere in West Virginia. I can now remove that tree because it's technically a danger tree. But the problem with these ash borer trees is we've had a lot of our uh, folks who do this work get hurt because while the tree looks solid, the tree will fall and it'll fall with no intervention from any human. So for instance, we were trimming some of these trees uh, last summer and two of them fell while we were trimming one beside. And, it, and it's so you have to be careful. So then what do you do? You have to take an outage on that circuit so you can remove that tree because to your point, it's a 40 foot tall tree on the edge of a 40 foot right away or 20 foot from the line, right? Because the line runs in the middle. So I got a 40 foot tall tree. I'm trying to remove it. It falls by itself, circuits out. So instead we'll schedule that circuit out and then we'll remove those trees. Now, another outage for the customer, don't get me wrong, but it's an outage though to, if you can hopefully plan around versus impacting you when you're working from home or, or your child's trying to learn from school on home, home learning, so. But there's people just a couple weeks ago who on the hottest day of the summer were without power for over 24 hours due to your equipment failing. Mm -hmm. That was a transformer failure, yes. So it's your equipment that failed and caused the outage? On, the, on that particular instance, yes, we did have a piece of equipment fail. Is it your responsibility to pay damages back to the people? It is not. Do you think you morally should have to do that? Well, asking my opinion of that, that that's not part of this. So I think that what we do is the Public Service Commission and our company, they regulate how we do things. They regulate how we do everything. And we follow those rules to a T and that's how we operate. And so that piece of equipment failed and if we wouldn't have done what we have done, the way we solved that problem with a piece of mobile equipment and the way we've set up our processes and procedures, that could have been a four or five day outage easy. Five years ago, it would have been a five day outage. We were able to get it back in, I think about 22 hours, if I remember right, but, but we did that because we've made these things of mobile equipment and the way to bring this stuff in and, and get it online quickly. Now, it's not a permanent fix, but it's a fix to get the power back on very quickly and then the permanent fix will fall behind. You have to order a new piece of equipment, delivery time's about a year, so we gotta do all that. And so, but we got their power back within 24 hours. At that time, a customer had reached out to us saying that your representatives told them, yes, you might have to go pay for a hotel room because it's the hottest day of the year and you need air conditioning, but the good news for you is you're not paying rates right now because the electricity's out. Well, I, I don't know who would have said that. We should have never responded that way if we did. Really, if I might interject, could you tell me who that, could you tell Chris who that customer was who contacted the station? 
I'm not sure who that How customer is. The wife of the owner, of the wife of the vice president of the company that owns WSAC. So I think if we're going, if we're going to. But does that mean that, that, does that it, only certain people should have a wife? No, 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 Do we no, care no, about no, different no, customers no, differently? I'm saying if you're talking about a person and that person happens to be vice president of the company what that owns the station. What does that matter? What does it matter who it is? I've called. I'm an AP customer. I've certainly, called before. Certainly. Well, then, Should I not have reliable power? Certainly. But I'm just then saying, what are we talking about? I'm saying that if, if that's where this comes from. But what does it matter? He's an AP customer. He should have reliable service. Well, he's, he's welcome to call. Chris, how is, everyone's welcome to call. How is it different if my power is out or your power is out? It's still a power outage. It, it makes no difference. Who's, what, well, clarify that. It does make a difference on whose power is out. So hospitals first, right? Critical infrastructure first. There is a process we have to follow on who gets restored first. So it does matter whose power is out. But on the nicest sunny day of the year, does it matter? If a hospital's out, we follow that protocol, whether it's cold, raining, or a sunny day. We have to follow that protocol. On the outage you're talking about, I don't know all the customers are out. I don't. But I know we do as a company. I just don't know it. So could we look at all that and look at it? Yeah, but we followed our procedures to a T. And like I said, four or five years ago, that had been a four or five day outage. You see these numbers and all of the numbers that you file with the Public Service Commission say that outage numbers are increasing, so is the duration of those outages. So can we kind of agree that what's happening right now isn't working? Well, so I, so I disagree with that a little bit, and here's why. So if you take trees out of the right of way out of the calculation and you look at all other causes our safety improvement has been improving year over year for the last three years public filed with public service commission all all public data trees in the right of way shadow that because those because of our trim program trees out of right of way is up significantly mm -hmm. outage cost also filed with public service commission so i think the things we're doing are improving that i think and i know we've said this in our filing in anywhere from two to three years after the first trim cycle is over, which finished in 2020, we think these danger trees out of the right of way or the ash borer trees or whatever you want to call them, we think we're going to have those will be pretty much, they'll probably be down, right, for lack of better terms. And then we think that those edge trees will be hardened enough now since they're exposed to the wind, the rain, all the things that are happening, and you won't see that happening as much. So what we believe is you're going to see these trees out of the right of way start to go down, okay? And then when we see that, you'll start to see the benefits of all the other things we're doing because they are improving and have been improving year over year for the last three years. But your outage numbers overall are still going up. And a lot of those are caused by equipment failures. Trees out of the right of way, number one cause. Equipment failure is number two. Yeah, half of trees out of the right of way. And we are addressing the equipment failures also with the Public Service Commission. I know you've read it, you should have read it. It explains every circuit that's on that list, what we've done to improve that list, and the outcome we have seen. And if you look through that list, and it's multi, multi pages, it's very clear, trees out of the right of way are the number one cause by far. Equipment that was on the list for, I think what you're alluding to is we're not fixing our equipment, I think is what you're trying to say. You look at those circuits where we fix that equipment, those circuits have come off of the list. And so we are maintaining the equipment, we are replacing it, would we like to do it faster? Yes. Can we do it faster? Cost versus benefit. And I have the report with me right here today, your 2020 filing. I also have the 2015 one, if we yep. want to go back that far. And there are a number of different circuits in here that have been on the worst performing list yes. for at least five years in a row. That's correct. So you're not really solving that issue then, if they are continually the worst performing. So you have to look at that close because it'll show you how that circuit is improving as we work on it. Once again, some of those circuits are 300 miles long. And so can I fix it from end to end? We have what's called a prescription for that type of circuit, right? And what that really means is I start from the substation and I go all the way out to where the last customer's hooked to it. And we fix everything from A clear to Z. So that's a prescription for that type of circuit. But a 300 mile long circuit takes a long time to repair because in the midst of what I'm trying to repair that, I have an ice storm. I have a derecho. I, have a, I go to Louisiana and help them support when they have a storm. So we work on this stuff all the time, but there are reasons why we get pulled off of fixing what I will call, that would be like what I call normal maintenance and repair, okay? 
So we've identified an issue through an inspection or through um, uh, indicators from either customer outages or Sadie or Katie, whatever you want to look at. And so we notify that that circuit is a bad circuit. So we develop a plan to fix it. And like I said, we start on it on day one and we say we'll have it done in six months. But that six months may take a year because out of that year I've worked on it, I wasn't working on it for six months because I was pulled off to go somewhere else. Ice storm, derecho, off system support, all things we have to do. But you have 3,200 employees across Appalachian Power. You brought in roughly 800 to 1,000 of them after the ice storm. There's plenty of other employees out there that could be working on these sorts of things. But where do you think they're at before they come here, working on their own stuff? And when I bring them here, it is very expensive. So if I bring someone, let's just say from AEP Ohio, which is our sister company just across the river, right? And they did come here and help mm -hmm. us. When they come here, they are more expensive than my employees are that are here. And so it's always a balancing act. So if I need help from off system, that's what we call that, then I have to weigh the cost is the extra cost because the customer is going to pay for that. Is that value enough to add that cost to the gain I get by returning the service? And you have to weigh that. That's the balance piece I was talking about earlier. You guys spent 65 to $75 million on the ice storm recovery effort. And in your filings, you say you're going to try to regain that money in rate increases or some sort of recovery effort. That's correct. People didn't have to have the ice storm come here. You guys are the ones who are responsible for getting the power on and making sure it stays on. Why should the customers have to pay for you just making sure the lights are on? Who do you think should pay for it? The company that made $14 billion last year. So let's be clear. You're referencing cost of AEP, the corporation, and you can't say that's what APCO makes. So we're talking about APCO in this interview, not AEP, correct? So APCO did not even make its authorized return last year as a company, okay? So we are what's termed in my business as under earning. Ice storm comes, okay, lots of damage. How much did you say, $76 million? Uh, about 75, according to your filing right. for PSC. So the, the way the system is set up is that all of our costs are passed off to our customer. The cost to build that circuit originally is paid for by the customer. Maintaining that circuit, just normally, forget about an ice storm, mm -hmm. normal maintenance goes back to the customer. If that circuit gets ripped completely down from a derecho or an ice storm, pass back to the customer to put it back up. That's who pays for this stuff. That's how it works. So the customers just have to be the ones to live with this sort of an issue? Well, we do live with it. All of us have to. That, that's how the system is set up to work. And so what we try to do is we try to, so for instance, a lot of the damage from the ice storm that we are still working on today, we don't go back and put the same thing back, right? Because we know that the ice brought it down. So a lot of that stuff was built in the, you know, say 1940s, give or take. So different design standards. So when we fix the stuff, there's two ways you fix it. One, you fix it to get it back on as quickly as possible. You're trying to get the customer's power back to your point. The second thing is, is you don't build back the same you build back a more resilient system. And so it can withstand maybe the next derecho, hopefully, or the next ice storm. And so the stuff we fix and build back is to a better design. It's called resiliency is the term we use. So we try to put back a more resilient system. So the customer benefits from that. The customer's also having to pay for it, and they're the ones having to go out. They don't already have a generator on their house that they had bought, right. like you do. Right. Yep, I understand that. And, and, and look, I feel for them. I do. I've lost stuff, too. I get it. And my power goes out a lot also. And I know it is not a good place to be. And like we, have, we are trying to do everything we can to fix it in a balanced way. And we're trying to balance the investment versus the reward. When your power goes out as the president of the company, how do you feel? Well, I want to know why it's out. And then what are we doing to fix it? But not mine. What are we doing to get everybody's back? I'm the last one on. That's the way we do it. The last kind of question I had that I was hoping to follow back up on, loop back around, is you talk about these smart circuits and all these sorts of technology that is going into place, and yes. it's infrastructure, it's investment, yep. and that's what you say needs to be done to reduce these outages. But you say it won't be across the entire state. Is there ever going to be a permanent solution to this sort of an issue here in West Virginia? Well, so, so permanent solution would be, what, what would you determine, what's a permanent solution? What is Something that? that keeps the power from going out. Something to alleviate the, the frequency of the outages and the duration of the outages. 
Okay, so we, that's what we're doing right now. We're doing that very thing. And like I said, if you take away the trees out of right away, the data is very clear. It shows that that's improving. And so, as we said, on the trees out of the right away, we think in a couple of years, you'll see that go down and you'll see improvement. And you'll see, all customers will see it. But the data is clear. We are making that improvement today. It is getting better. Um, now, will it ever be zero? The answer is no. And is it zero anywhere in the United States? The answer is also no. Uh, so it's just, it's not going to happen. The answer for that is no across the United States, but Washington, D.C., they have an average of less than one outage per year. Here in West Virginia, we're at almost three outages per year on average per household. Mm -hmm. And so I love the comparisons you use. So Washington, D.C. is a strictly a suburb, correct? And in a suburb, the majority of that power is actually underground, like in downtown Charleston and downtown Huntington. Those are two cities we can compare. If you look at the folks that are on, that's called a network. If you look at the folks that are on the network in Charleston, or the folks that are on the network in Huntington, you'll see their power is hardly ever out also, because it's on an underground network system, just like DC is. So underground works? Underground works in the city arrangement like that, yes. But you say it's not feasible for other people in more rural didn't, areas? Didn't say it's not feasible. You can certainly do it. You can do it all day long. Nobody can afford to pay for it. That's the problem. It's hugely expensive. But comparing D.C. To, to here is not a fair comparison. What about Massachusetts? They have plenty of trees and mountains there. They do. And they're very similar to us in outages. No. On there, they have eight-tenths of an outage per household per year. Mm -hmm. And we have three. Yes. Right? Yep. Yeah. So, I, you know, look, I don't work in Massachusetts. I have no idea what their recovery mechanisms are, and I have no idea what their, I, I just don't know. So I, I can't comment on it. I can only comment on ours. Are you happy with the way things are going now? No, not at all. I, I look, I, I would love to have no outages ever. But the reality is, is there's not enough money in people to make that happen. And if I had enough people, then there's not the money. And that's the issue we have, right? So our rates are already high. You all know that, right? If I keep investing more money quickly, rates keep going up. Will you see benefit from that? The answer is yes. Can you afford to pay your bill? No. And if you can't afford to pay your bill, you can't do it. And that's the balancing act we have to do. And you're right. A majority of our customers are on fixed income. No doubt about it. We know the exact number. The problem is, though, is they want their power to be on all the time, so I have to invest a little to do that. And when I make that investment, the way this whole structure is set up, those costs go back to all customers. Now granted, it's socialized for all, but that's how it works. Do you ever go out and talk with customers? I do. How often? What do they tell you? Well, since the pandemic started, no. But before the pandemic, all the time. What do you hear from them? It depends on what customer you're talking to. You hear everything from, I have horrible service, to you guys do a great job. And, and if you looked on social media today, we had a, you all did a great job. So restoring an outage in Virginia. So it just depends on who you talk to. And it, who's impacted by it and who's not. Where do you live? If you live in these, if you live in the Huntington and the Charleston and the Beckley areas, you're going to have more better reliability than if you live in Hamlet or if you live in the more rural areas. And, and, and when you look at our circuits that are on the report you have, you'll see it's the rural circuits that are a couple hundred miles long that are the biggest impacts. And they're also the most expensive to repair and the longest to fix because of how long they are. So is it someone's fault because of where they live? I don't know. I never said it was anyone's fault. No, you live wherever you want. It's just the infrastructure is more difficult because of where these folks are living from where it's coming from, the source. And so you, you think of it like this. Think of a 300, long, 300 mile long extension cord. That's a fair way to look at this. And a tree falls on mile one out of the substation. Anybody from mile one out is out. And it'll be out until I fix it, right? This automated technology I was talking to you about earlier, I can still have a tree go through that line in mile one. And the, I'm going to put a tie somewhere in this 300 long mile circuit. And the automated technology will pick up that. It'll pick up where it happened. It'll, close, it'll open this to make it safe for everyone. So you got an outage. But it'll also find the largest, the farthest customer out that I can feed back to, and it'll make you switch, and I'll feed that customer all the way back, and I'll stop and leave a small outage. Like I said, in milliseconds. I mean, th that's pretty good. No human intervention needed, and that's how it has to be. So if you think about a 300-mile long circuit, 
I don't know where the outage action is on that circuit. Now, when I have AMI meters on every house, which we won't have till the end of next year, I'll know exactly every house that's out. Today, I don't know that. So how do I find out? I put someone in one of these trucks and they start driving the circuit. That's how I find out. So we're looking at another year and a half before people see any real improvement? The, the AMI meters, yes. About, yeah, be the end of next year. And then tie the AMI meter in, now I know where the outage is. So instead of telling them to go drive a 300 mile long circuit, I'm gonna tell them to go look at pole XYZ and it's in this area. So that's a difference in response time. So now the outage may be shorter because I don't have to drive 300 mile circuit anymore. Now I go kind of roughly within, let's say a five mile range, right? I know where to go and then I can get it restored quicker. And that's what all this technology is gonna do for us. And we're seeing that already. That's how we knocked off 400, 4 million minutes. But what should people do in the meantime? It's a year and a half away. Well, we're installing all of it as we speak today. Now, the pandemic slowed all this down, right? Because struggling to get labor to do the work. And then the other thing we wanted to, we did, so if I want to put an AMI meter on your house, I got to basically shut your house off. And if I want to do some of this uh, retrofit or maintenance work, I got to shut your house off. And so during the pandemic, we made the decision as a company, and, and but all power companies that listen, folks are working from home, kids are learning from home. Let's minimize any of these outages. So we kind of slowed this whole process down because I don't want to shut you off if you're trying to work or you're trying to learn from home. So I think technically, it, I don't know, it kind of feels like maybe we're starting to come out of this a little bit. Kids are kind of back in school now. I think some folks are back in the office more than there were. So we're starting to pick this installation back up. But you gotta be mindful of all these things. Thank you. any difference in their service or the number of outages or how long it takes to get the power back on. We, I know, you know, when we've looked at numbers, the, long, the length of the outage is substantially more here than really anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And there's places like Clendenin, the Walton area, oh, yeah. that are awful. And there's what? people up there that just say, I've called them to get these trees trimmed and they've never come out. Well, so listen, so never is a pretty strong word. We've trimmed every one of our circuits from end to end in the last four years. So to say we've never trimmed it, that is not true. We've trimmed it in the last four years, all of our circuits. Now we have a lot of customers that'll call and say, you gotta get out here, your tree, trees are in your lines. And they're in the cable and the phone, they're not in the power line. That's not our responsibility. We're responsible for the power line. We get a lot of that, actually almost daily. So that's not ours. We send folks out and we tell them it's not ours to cut call the phone company or the cable company or whoever. So we get that all the time. But like I said, to, to your question, 300 mile long circuit. If I drive 300 miles, how long does that take? If I'm driving up through like the Clendenin area, right? You're not gonna go 65 or 70. You're going probably 25 or 30, maybe at best. It's always been the same drive. Why is it taking longer to get the power back on? It's not taking longer. It just, the problem is, is you're having more tree caused outages and that's what's causing the problem. So you're having more outages, more frequency in outages. Numbers indicate that. And the majority of those are from trees out of the right of way. So do you think that we need to put more emphasis on the tree trimming program, that it needs to be more than a four year cycle, or you know, certain areas need to get more attention faster than the, the four years that they would normally get? So that's a great question. Um, and so what we're doing right now, so we benchmark how we do veg, that's called veg management for us, by the way, mm -hmm. if you see it in these filings, it's just, tree trimming we call veg management. And so what we've done, we've done a bunch of benchmarking with all kinds of utilities to figure out how do they do it? How do we do it? Can we learn anything better from them? And can we do it cheaper than we're currently doing it? Because the price for veg management is going up. And so what we have learned is the weather patterns have certainly changed and we won't get into the argument of maybe why that is, but certainly they have changed. And while we track record rainfall, and when you look at it from a year over year basis for West Virginia, you say, well, look, total rainfall for the year is kind of pretty close to what it's always been, right? But we got to break it down a little further and say, well, wait a minute, but I'm getting that total rainfall in like four events instead of 15 events or 20 events. And so then what happens is, is you get saturated soils, trees are, you have that, we're having a lot more landslides or hill slides, whatever you want to call them, and those impact all of our lines also. So now we're looking at, okay, so two things. One, do I need to move this circuit? So Maybe it shouldn't be on the hillside anymore. So do I make it, do I move it along the road? 
So you introduce all new issues when you put it along the road, as you all know, trees, trucks hit stuff, cars, you know that. So, so is that issue less than the issue leaving it here? That's one. Two, do I trim this area? And this is back to your question. Do maybe I trim that, let's just pick an area, Glendon, and let's just use that area. It has different trees. It has different vegetation growth there. We know what it is. We have it all documented. We've got a database now that tells us based on rainfall that we're seeing, different vegetation reacts differently. Some of it slows down if it gets too much rain. Some of it speeds up. So now we're going to take that data and say, okay, do we then say, so yet yeah, we're on a four-year trim cycle, but maybe I did Glendennan three years ago and I don't have to go back for a year. Maybe then instead I have to go back now because of the science of the rainfall, the vegetation that's there, maybe I have to trim it every third year instead of every fourth year. So that's the stuff where we've got all that incorporated today. We're working on that as a way to get smarter about how we trim, where we trim. So that's stuff we're working on. Just for clarity, that's something you're working on. Like yeah. it's not, that's not something that's happening now. We are using it today in a pilot, yes. In a pilot. What difference is that making for customers right now then? Well, it's, we have not done enough of this yet to, to even tell you if there's value here. I just don't know yet. When might you know? I'd say it'd probably take about, I'd say, a year to get some enough data behind it to say, did that make a difference or not? And the only reason I say a year is because you like to go through the seasons. You want to cycle all four seasons to see if it makes a difference. But you're even doing this because you're getting a sense that there are some areas that need to be trimmed more than every four to five years. That very well, yeah, very well could be, yes. Yep. But like you picture you showed me here earlier, this kudzu growing up the pole, right? I mean, that could be just six months ago. I, I don't know, right? I just don't know. But, but kudzu grows very fast. It was brought to this country for the very reason, so it could do that for ground cover. And now it's, of course, out of control. And so it is very problematic for us and everyone else. Is there a final message you know, to, to customers who are frustrated with outages? Yeah, look, you know, <laughs> I'm frustrated too, right? And our, and our employees are really frustrated, right? So. If our employees have to respond to an outage, they're not working on the stuff that keeps an outage from happening, right? So we don't have an endless supply of employees. And so if I have to go work an outage, I'm pulling off the work that I'm doing that's gonna to try to hopefully keep you from having an outage, right? And so they are frustrated. And uh, so the only thing I would tell the customers is, look, we understand that outages impact you. We know it and, and look, we apologize that they happen and we're trying to do everything we can in our power to make that not happen but we have to balance the investment and the return. And that's what we're trying to do. And technology is gonna to have to help us do it. We just can't do it the way we've always done it and expect a different result, right? So we're gonna to try to do it a little different and hopefully get a better result. But if you're doing the same thing, how can you expect a different result? Uh, well, weather can, weather can give you a totally different result all by itself. I mean, it just, it literally can. If you, have a, if you have a, what I would call a would normal year of weather, which we haven't had the whole time I've been here, but if you have a normal year of weather, you can drop your Sadie or Katie, you can probably drop it 100 points just by Mother Nature alone. And then you think you're doing really great, and then the next year you have an abnormal year of weather, Sadie and Katie goes up by 100, and they're like, what are you all doing? And so, and you really didn't do anything different other than Mother Nature changed her plan for you. And that's a lot of the issue. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate you taking us through all of this and yep. answering all the questions. I'm sure you get the same from all of the customers the same way we do. Oh, yeah. This is maybe the second largest thing we have people call us about. I'd say the first one's probably internet outages and the yep. second's power outages. Yep. yep. And those, those are the same two things that the Public Service Commission gets the most of, too. Mm -hmm. Internet and power outages. So, yeah, well aware. Wonderful. Did we cover everything you wanted to cover? So, yeah, buddy. definitely. Okay. Mm -hmm. All good. Okay. Thank you. Yep, thank you.